Public anger in Turkish cities as the army buries its dead. 24 soldiers killed in an unprecedented and highly coordinated series of strikes by Kurdish fighters. The government is pointing its finger at what it calls foreign elements behind the attacks. But some Turks maintain that the government itself must accept some blame. Is the Kurdish issue back to haunt Turkey once again? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mike Hanna. Turkey is continuing a massive military offensive against Kurdish militants. This follows what appeared to be a series of coordinated attacks against Turkish military positions in Hakkari province on the border with Iraq. At least 24 soldiers were killed in eight simultaneous assaults, the largest attack in years. The Turkish military has said in a statement that around 10,000 soldiers, backed by warplanes and helicopters, are taking part in an operation being conducted in both Turkey and northern Iraq. Prime Minister Recep Erdogan says this is an operation aimed at getting results, but at the same time is fending off opposition claims that the PKK action is a direct result of his government's policies. Anita McNaught has more. The Turkish military swung into full retaliatory mode, helicopter gunships and artillery hitting targets both inside Turkey's southeast and across the border in Kurdish northern Iraq. For all that Turkey has a massive standing army, you have to appreciate how vulnerable any army would be in terrain like this. This is one of the bases behind me in Çukurca, which uh, was attacked by the Kurdish PKK fighters in the early hours on Wednesday morning. And you can see it's ringed by an enormous mountain range, uh, an area that is very, very difficult to defend, despite the resources that Turkey has thrown at this. The military death toll is one of the highest from any single PKK attack since the 1990s. But the PKK claims it's responding to months of sustained aggression by the Turkish state. But at a defiant press conference, Prime Minister Erdogan pointed the finger at other countries, saying they were using the Kurds against Turkey's growing strength in the region. Events of recent days demonstrates very clearly that this terror organization is a tool in the hands of certain powers. The terror organization has shown that they are subcontractors. They are being used by other powers, other forces. They are merely trying to provoke society. The Turkish government has to deal with the anger among the Turkish people, uh, especially the Turkish people far away from here, who don't perhaps realize quite what life is like for Kurds. Uh, there's a great disconnect between the western urban centers of Turkey and how they perceive the Kurdish problem and how the Kurds would portray the reality of their lives. That's one of the problems Turkey has here. Just two years ago, PKK fighters came down from the mountainous region to express support for Ankara's Kurdish initiative. But this year, hundreds of Kurdish political activists have been arrested and elected Kurdish representatives blocked from parliament. Now, both sides are accusing the other of bad faith and betrayal. Anita McNaught for Inside Story. The Turkish Prime Minister insists much has been done to address the Kurdish issue since his AKP party came to power nine years ago. Its first step in 2002, lifting a 15-year-old state of emergency that had been imposed in the predominantly Kurdish southeast. In 2003, the government lifted most of the bans on the Kurdish language. In 2005, Prime Minister Erdogan, in a speech in a predominantly Kurdish province, acknowledged that the state has made mistakes in dealing with the Kurdish issue. Then in 2009, the AKP government launched what it called the Kurdish Opening, an initiative it maintained was aimed at creating a new beginning in relations between the Kurdish minority and the state. But the so-called peace process never really took off each side accusing the other of acting in bad faith throughout. Joining us now are our three guests. In Istanbul, Yavuz Bayda is a political columnist with the Turkish newspaper Today Zaman. In London, Ibrahim Dogus, the director of The Telegraph, Turkey's only Kurdish newspaper. And also in Istanbul, Joshua Walker, transatlantic fellow at the American think tank German Marshall Fund. Welcome to you all. Well, let's begin with Yavuz Bayda. 24 dead, a shocking number, but also of concern perhaps the level of coordination and the operational capability in these attacks. How great a concern? 
Well, uh, that's uh, quite a long time uh, uh, that uh, such a big, massive operation took place across the border to Iraq. And uh, certainly there are concerns because we are talking about 22 battalions of elite troops Elite being the new element in this, because former operations always involved uh, usual common soldiers. But still, we are talking about around 10,000 soldiers, uh, and including officers. And this is certainly a risky operation. Uh, there are scarce uh, details about the, the, the length and, and uh, uh, also the time of the operation, how long it will take, it, nobody knows. but speculations about one to uh, three weeks and uh, this is going to be a pretty delicate uh, period uh, for the Turkish opinion because uh, the, the concern is uh, high casualties uh, possibly uh, that would turn uh, the opinion public opinion even more upside down. Well let's go to Ibrahim Dogos in London and the timing of this attack why would it happen at this particular point? Is there any particular reason you believe? I mean, there are many reasons behind uh, the current escalation of the conflict in Turkey between the government, the military and the Kurdish people. As you have clearly described in your um, opening remarks, uh, there has been um, a, a secret dialogue. There has been public diplomacy uh, on the both sides of the, you know, on the both sides, uh, both for, for, from the Turkish government side and the Kurdish side. They, we, everyone from Turkey, believed that uh, there was a there was a desire to look for a solution to Kurdish question. And there has been several uh, sort of exposed secret meetings by the government uh, with, the gov with the government officials and the PKK officials in Europe. But, uh, th you know, uh, it is difficult to understand why those negotiations have failed and it is difficult to, uh, to analyze uh, why uh, ex you know, right now we are seeing an, a huge sort of increase in the current escalation of the, of the conflict. Well, Joshua Walker, what's your view? Why this increase at this particular time? I mean, the timing is certainly uh, suspicious on a lot of different levels. The particular town that was attacked in Hakkari uh, was the exact area in which the Turkish president had just been a few days earlier. It was an attack the day before. Uh, the fact that it's right along the borders, right in the middle of a major uh, kind of regional hotbed that's going on right now between Turkey's deteri deteriorating relations with Israel, at the same time that there's been more problems domestically in Turkey, the timing couldn't have come at a worse possible time. Well, Yavuz Baider, let's get back to that point that you brought up, that this is going to be very difficult for the government if it does intend or is committed to pushing through any form of resolution, in particular the parliamentary dialogue discussion about a constitution which many regard as critical if this issue is to be properly addressed. Well, uh, this issue will always be uh, on the agenda, as it has been uh, in the past two decades, but particularly so in the past eight years or so, particularly after the Kurdish opening, as you mentioned at the beginning. And this is, going, this is not going to leave the political debate in connection with the new constitution. Uh, and, and as uh, Erdogan recently, in two different addresses in the past three days, underlined uh, democratization and reforms will continue. Uh, he mentioned that there would be such attempts, uh, but nothing will stop this, this uh, opening, further opening towards a civil society and also major reform in the context of the Constitution. So, uh, of course, this is, this is straining the, the atmosphere, uh, and this is also perhaps aimed at opening the gaps between the opposition and the, and the government. But, uh, one remarkable element in this is that the public opinion remains uh, remarkably uh, calm uh, and uh, uh, sort of in, in expectation that, uh, that there will be a final solution and settlement in this issue. So uh, up to, uh, we are talking about up to 60 to 70 percent of the public opinion in the latest surveys uh, wishing a final solution in, in, this, in this conflict and also uh, in the um, last two elections we should take into account that almost the half of the national Kurdish vote in the national context was divided between the uh, PKK's political wing PBDP and AKP so the reform process obviously in the past four years uh, has helped uh, sort of uh, soften 
the, the Kurdish anger and frustration, the more opening with sort of zigzagging but uh, continuous, uh, slow but gradual reforms, it has helped to, to, to cause uh, uh, sort of a uh, glide towards more democratic debate. Well, let's uh, pick up Obraham uh, Dogos on that particular point. You mentioned there that uh, part of the AKP support in this recent election actually came from the Kurdish vote, a very significant part. Is there perhaps the possibility, um, Ibrahim Dogos, that this is not in the interests of the PKK, that it is precisely because of this apparent democratization uh, that it is upping the ante, that it is intensifying its operations at this point? I don't think this is the case because purely because PKK has been declaring several ceasefires within the last five, ten years. Since AK Party won the elections in 2002, PKK and the Kurdish political movements within Turkey have been very encouraging, have been very supportive of AK Party and its policies because the government and Prime Minister Erdogan himself on many, many occasions, including 2005 in Diyarbakir, have stated that he is sorry for what has been done to Kurdish people in Turkey. He is apologizing for the mistakes of the past and he is opening up a new framework for further democratic in the country. But unfortunately, we haven't seen much impact of that on the ground. What happened is, you know, AK Party government has been continuously promising Kurdish people uh, that they will be granting further rights, cultural rights, um, you know, uh, linguistic rights to the Kurdish people in the country. But apart then, state TV channel, which has begun to broadcast in Kurdish language, we have not seen much happening on the ground. Well, AK Party government. Uh, has been trying to, you know, have been, have been saying to, to, to the people that they are aiming for a political solution. At the same time, they have not had a proper dialogue with the BDP, which is in the parliament. It's a peace and democracy party. And they have continuously arrested thousands and thousands of BDP officials, BDP may elected mayors, including activists. And uh, from the current election, we know that there are still six elected members of parliament belong to Kurdish community, Kurdish people, who are still in prison in this atmosphere under these conditions how would you expect Kurdish people to believe that you know the government is sincerely interested in a political solution well, there's let's, always let's been a spot up. I just would like to at this stage uh, Ibrahim if I may just pick up with Joshua walk on that particular point that you raised which is particularly important dozens of people arrested in the recent weeks alone among them a number of parliamentarians yeah. it does appear that the Turkish government saying it is committed to achieving some kind of resolution at the same time is still wielding a pretty heavy hand in terms of dealing with Kurdish activists. Uh, is there a, a kind of dichotomy in what the government is doing? I mean, I think that every guest, and you've hit the nail on the head in a certain way, basically this problem, the Kurdish problem, has been with the Turkish Republic since the foundation of the Republic. So the idea that you can have just one opening a couple years ago or you can apologize and have a political solution that happens very quickly uh, that's not in tandem with a real kind of reconciliation of what it means to be a Turkish citizen, what it means to be Turkish, the discussions that are ongoing in this country, a place that's full of paradigms, full of paradoxes, is unrealistic. And I think the idea that the Prime Minister and his party in 2009 declared that they were going to solve this problem. They declared a Kurdish opening. There was a lot of optimism. A lot of people supported this. And then two years down the road, uh, a lot of people are calling this a failure. A lot of people are looking around and saying, what has actually changed on the ground? I mean, the issue here is you have a political solution that seems to be very far off. Uh, we already referenced the fact that the BDP, uh, which does speak on behalf of the PKK in different cases, the, the problem in this country right now is there's becoming this feeling that somehow all Kurds are associated with the PKK, and that's just not the case here. There's only a very, very small minority of the Kurdish population here in Turkey that actually wants to see an autonomous and separate region. The question of what type of uh, solution in terms of being able to speak your own mother tongue, the idea of feeling like a full citizen of this country that has gone through so much reform, so much change in the last 10 years, when is that going to be seen on the ground in the southeastern parts of this country, being able to have Kurdish citizens uh, who also are Turkish citizens who can be proud on both sides of that? That's become a real challenge, and it's become particularly difficult when Turkey and the, the pri prime minister and other leaders walk around on the international stage and lecture others when at home one of the biggest problems remains the Kurdish question. And I think that what's happened this week reminds us of the challenges that still continue to be here in this country. Well, we, we mentioned the regional challenges that are happening at present as well. And let's just take a look at that. The attack by PKK forces comes at a time when Turkey is facing strained relations with a number of its neighbors in the region. 
Tension with Iraq rises every time Turkish forces cross the border to conduct operations against PKK fighters. Iran is angry at Turkey's decision to allow early warning radar installations on its territory, this as part of a NATO defense system. Relations with Syria have deteriorated, this after Turkey formally said it had lost faith in President Bashar al-Assad. And what was once a warm partnership between Turkey and Israel is now more of a cold war. This following the Israeli attack on a Turkish aid ship bound for Gaza. Turkey has expelled Israeli diplomats and ended all military cooperation deals, while Israel continues to refuse to formally apologize for the attack. It's been a period of shifting alliances in the region, but some would argue that this is precisely the time the Turkish government should make every effort to resolve the Kurdish issue. Your view, Yavuz Baida. Well, it's a, it's a great context because we should speak about this, this context. Uh, the, the, the region is very fluid, very volatile, very quickly changing, and the, the positions of the actors, major actors in the, in the, in the region is changing. Um, the relations with Iraq uh, is not as bad as maybe, maybe you say. Now uh, we see a warming up of relations between both the Iraqi Kurdish leadership and also Baghdad with, and, and Ankara. Uh, this time, a very open support, uh, a verbal support, and also, uh, obviously, logistical support in the uh, right after the operation by the by the Kurdish Peshmergas uh, is happening. So this means that there is some sort of uh, common ground, more strong common ground between between Iraqi Kurds and, and Ankara, uh, than based on uh, more far-sighted strategic interests. And also, Americans are supporting it very clearly, very. Uh, uh, very lucidly from Obama uh, that Turkey has a right to defend itself and uh, also a right, right to have the hot, hot pursuit. So in this volatile situation, in this context, the, the obvious question is where does now today's PKK stand? Because this role of PKK is also inevitably changing. Uh, it's changing in, in terms of its relations with the with with Bashar Assad, it's, it's, it's giving strong signals that, that to, to the region's Kurds that it should support uh, ba Bashar Assad's regime should continue. And it has uh, blurred relations with, with the Irani regime. So uh, the PKK is, is, is different now. It's a different organization let's, with let's, a let's pick up on, on that particular sort point. of leadership. So it's, 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 its actions are different. But let's pick up on that particular point there. You have. Um, some six million Kurds living in Iran. You have five million roughly in Iraq. You have 1.5 million Kurds living in Syria. Now, these are all players in this ongoing uh, dilemma. Ibrahim Dogus, I'd like you to pick up on what Javis Baida was saying there about how much the shifting region, the changes within it, are impacting on the PKK and on this Kurdish issue. It certainly has a strong impact on the Kurdish politics in the region. We all remember, we should remember that Iran, Syria and Turkey up until recently were united against their fight with PKK. Iran and Turkey were bombing Kandil Mountains for months and weeks, I would say, uh, up until a few weeks ago. So Syria were arresting PKK activists, arresting Kurdish people, handing them over to Turkey. So they had a huge collaboration against Kurdish people. If now the political uh, dynamics are changed in the region, and if PKK is in a position to, make, to take advantage of the shift in the polit policies or politics of the region, then that's understandable, I would say. And it, is, it, it will be plausible for PKK to take advantage of uh, deteriorating relations between Syria and Turkey, between Iran and Turkey. But the best thing or the, or the most sort of um, good thing that the Turkish government could come up with is, is, to resol is, is a resolution to the Kurdish question within Turkey. Turkey tries to deal with Palestine, Turkey tries to deal with Somalia, Turkey tries to deal with all over the world now. They, they're so confident, the government is very confident and open about its international sort of aspirations and so on. But when it comes to Kurdish politics, they always look for other international forces or countries to blame for. I think the, the blame is still with Ankara. It's with the denial or, or, or you know, the, the, pro, the promises made, and, um, um, made by Ankara which were not kept to, to the Kurdish people. So the blame is still with Ankara, and Ankara needs to deal with its Kurdish population, with, with their concerns within Ankara, within Diyarbakir, not look at Damascus. They do not have to look at Tehran, or they do not have to look at Erbil, or Washington, or London, or anywhere else. Let, let 
let's just uh, move over to Joshua Walker on that particular issue. No, I would actually agree with what's been said in the sense that this has always been kind of the major Achilles heel for Turkey. And I think one of the issues here is as there's been the Arab Spring and there was an endorsement of the Palestinian Spring, so-called, at the United Nations, what would Turkey think of a Kurdish Spring? I mean, the Kurds are the largest people group. They don't have their own nation. And so, therefore, Turkey having the largest group or, you know, n numerically a population there, how do you reinterpret that? Even the term minority that you started at the beginning of this program would not be accepted by the Turkish government because they would say minority has a power dynamic and Kurdish citizens in Turkey have equal rights. Now, is that necessarily true? There are certainly people living in this town in Istanbul, Ankara, that have full rights. There are people a part of the government who are part of the solution, but there are others who are in southeastern parts of the country, more rural areas, they don't have the same rights. They haven't been empowered in the same way. And so it's really been an unequal distribution as they move towards some type of resolution. Unfortunately, it seems that all these international dynamics, the regional dynamics that you talk about, are getting complicated here. I don't think it, you, we don't need to look too far back in history. Back in 1998, that was when Syria was very heavily supporting the PKK. They kicked out Ojan after the military moved his troops there. In the same way, Syria, which has had a honeymoon period with Turkey, that honeymoon has ended. Is Assad going to be supporting the PKK again? Israel, which used to be uh, Turkey's one of its closest allies, its foreign minister has said that they might start supporting the PKK. And the moment after that happens, these major attacks happens, it's hard not to see people in the streets talking about the conspiracy. And so I don't think this is just a regional, I don't think this is just a domestic, this is an international problem uh, that involves all these different actors that become particularly complicated. And I think that the, the way that we began this discussion about saying there is a silver lining here is absolutely true. As Turkey has begun to experience its new newfound strength strength, newfound power in the region remembering where its anchor remains, and part of that is with the transatlantic community. Understanding that the United States has been with Turkey for the last 30 years fighting the war on terror. We've called the PKK a terrorist organization from the very beginning when some other European countries have not. Being able to work together and also with the regional actors and not letting this become uh, a sore point that the enemies uh, of uh, different government factions. And I think also the new dimension here is the domestic side of things, because as much as democratization has happened in Turkey, it's also opened up major divides, whether it's well, between let's pick up the on AKP that particular and the point. military or whether it's between the other parties. How do we think about that? Well, let's pick up on that particular point with Yavuz Bayda. Very briefly, uh, Yavuz, would you like to respond to that point, the domestic changes within Turkey, the whole creation of what the government said is this democratization as part of what could be a silver lining in resolving this issue? Well, look, as, as noted again, once more in the progress report by the European Union, which is one of the best... Uh, you know, reports to look at what's been achieved and what's not. Uh, the, the, the progress is, is still on and it's going on, but there are problems on, on major parts, including the Kurdish issue. The, the, the evolution is still taking place, uh, albeit slow, zigzagging, one two step forward, one step back. The, the major dilemma for, for today's Turkey's, Turkish societies as actors is, is whether to be part of this evolution, particularly now that Turkish parliament started to discuss the new constitution. Uh, it's also a major question for, for the Kurdish political movement to be part of that. Uh, don't forget that there are now the Kurdish BDP, uh, PKK's political wing has almost doubled its seats in the parliament and it is present in the parliament. It can partake in the, in the discussions if it wants to. The major issues are native tongue, uh, Kurd, the recognition of the Kurdish identity and decentralization. Well, let's just go at this particular stage. These are stage. all issues that should be discussed in democratic context. And the major question is whether PKK's continued arms usage, weapon usage will be helpful to that process. Well, let's go to Ibrahim Dogos on that particular point very uh, briefly. Is the political forces of the Kurds prepared at this stage to see it through for the long haul? First of all, we need to clarify some, something um, that Mr. Baidar has said. BDP is not a political wing of PKK. BDP is a legal entity within Turkey. It is a political you know, party formed within the legal um, life of Turkey. It's got 36 elected members of parliament, but it's got 30 people in the parliament. Six are still in prison. AK Party government has not been willing to negotiate on a new constitution. The newly written constitution will be a great achievement for the country, for Turkey. It, if, it's if it addresses the issues concerning uh, Kurdish question and all other issues uh, within Turkey. But we don't, I mean, although we hear a lot 
about a new constitution which will be a democratically um, a sort of newly written uh, based on a consensus amongst the people of Turkey, but we don't practically see um, uh, whether this is going to happen or not. Ibrahim Dogus, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to our guests, Yavuz Bayda, Ibrahim Dogus, and Joshua Walker. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.